How's it going, everyone? My name is Christopher, this is my dad, Leighton, and this is The Ostazen Show. Today, we're gonna to be discussing barking, what causes it, and how to address it. But first, we'll tell you a little bit about who we are and why we're doing this. You wanna tell a little about yourself for uh, the people that might not know you out there? Well, for those of you who don't know, my name's Leighton. I'm Christopher's dad. Really happy to be coming to you. We've decided to change our podcast around a little bit, mostly based on uh, questions. Uh, and uh, from statements from our clients and from our good friends and we're gonna make our podcast a little bit different but for those of you who don't know I'm a uh, background in dog training um, I was a, a competitive shooter and we're gonna talk a little bit about those things uh, but mostly tonight's about barking not us barking your dogs barking although you can bark if you want to yeah it's all it's all about uh, whatever you're into we're, we're not <clears throat> into that part of the world but uh, yeah so cool my name is uh, Christopher like my dad said course this is my dad um, this show you know we've worked together closely for the past six years we've been successful in, in business and, and shooting and all different aspects of marketing personal development things like that so that's really what we wanted this show to be about it's not just about dogs otherwise we would have named it the dog show um, it's a, really about all aspects of our lives and that's really what we wanted to to come across here now we totally understand that's not great branding it's not great consistency um, but that's okay. If, uh, if it is a disaster and no one wants to watch it, we'll look back in a few years and laugh at uh, the silly thought that we thought people would actually care about us. So, um, you know, with that said, we have a, a few plugs to throw in here and then a word from our sponsors, quote unquote. So obviously our sponsor has to be Partners Dog Training. Partners is who we are. Uh, Partners has, has basically provided for us. It's allowed us to travel. It's allowed us to save and work with many, many thousands of dogs. And we really appreciate the fact that we can use Partners as a kind of as a as a jump start as a model of for us to be able to get out and be able to to see you guys and so on yeah and the second <coughs> sponsor quote unquote is actually something new that we've started doing which is called hey ludwig we made an announcement about it uh, about a couple weeks back and that's actually kind of what sparked this whole uh trying to get back into the podcast game uh essentially ludwig is a uh, a bot on Facebook Messenger and he's your personal dog trainer. So you can message him, tell him about your dog and he uses uh, behavioral traits about your dog to create personalized curriculums to address problems, teach tricks, train obedience and a number of other things down the line. And the, the content's really, really high quality. It's methods that we've mastered over the years at Partners, um, you know, in the past 20 years, training over 35,000 dogs or so. So it's not something that you're gonna find anywhere else on the internet. This is our, our own methods that we've kind of devised and packaged in this nice little um, you know program that you can that you can learn from so really excited about that the uh, the website for that is heyludwig.com that's h-e-y-l-u-d-w-i-g and partnersdogs.com uh, both of those links will will throw in the bio so let's get started talking yeah. about barking. And, I, and I just want to talk about Ludwig for a second you know one of the things that we're really super excited about the Ludwig is that you know obviously we're a school we're based out of Cave Creek which is in North Phoenix here in Arizona and we have many thousands of people that come to us, but we also have thousands of other people that have written to me over the years that have asked for help. And it's very difficult to help somebody when they're sitting somewhere else. When I travel around, and I travel quite extensively because I shoot competitively, uh, when I travel around, people are forever asking me questions. And this is an opportunity now for us to be able to actually answer those questions and for you guys to get help with that. So we really want feedback. And, and if I can ask you a huge favor, go to Hey Ludwig and start running through it, kind of checking out, see if it works for you. It's very much still in its infancy. We, uh, Christopher has been doing most of the work on this for the last while, but we really need your ideas and your feedback as to how it works and whether it's really working for you. And then we'll change it on the back end and rewrite the codes or, or something like that, because it's, it's obviously something that can really be of great benefit to you guys. Everybody has a dog and everybody has, uh, has everyone's dogs has have a problem. Um, that being said, all right, let's talk about barking. So, Probably of all the emotionally uh, distressful uh, things that people have come across uh, with regard to their dogs, I would say barking and housebreaking are the two issues that, that show up the most. Uh, we're not going to talk about housebreaking or house training tonight. I'll come to that. Or we're going to kind of do a, a chat on that here in the next few weeks or in the next few podcasts. But for now, it's talking about barking. The biggest issue you have with barking is that dogs will often do it when we're not around and so you may not even be aware of that but fortunately nowadays with all the electronics that we have 
you know you can set up cameras like the the ring camera and there's all sorts of ones out there where you can actually monitor your dog your pet at home so that you prevent the the situation from escalating because once neighbors get involved once they call the police um, I had an email that uh, came in just a, oh, maybe a week ago from a friend who doesn't want to cause any drama with his neighbor, uh, but he's got this constant barking going on. Yeah, and uh, I gave him some pointers and said, look, this is something you can try. Now, this isn't even his dog. It's a neighbor's dog, but it's the same kind of thing. So barking is a, is a very controversial thing. It's a very, um, uh, not controversial, I should say. It's probably a frustrating, you know, frustrating and emotional thing. Um, and, it, and it can escalate. I know of people that have been kicked out of their apartments uh, from barking. So if you're having a barking problem, you're not alone out there. Everybody has it. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're <clears> literally <throat> going through it uh, at the moment. So let's take a look at some of the different you know, causes to barking. So we're going to kind of bounce back and forth here. The first cause that, uh, that we wanted to address is territorial barking. Now, mm -hmm. this is when a, basically your dog is barking at another person or another animal that's coming into what they consider their territory. Now this could be your home, this could be even you yourself. So um, obviously this is not a type of barking that we want to, uh, to have our dogs being doing or to have our dogs doing. So let's, we'll take a look at how to address that here in a moment. And we'll talk about the next one. Yeah, so the other one that we, we often come across is what we call fear-based or fearful barking. And that's generally something where, where a dog is, is sensing that there's a situation that is um, nerve-wracking to them, it might be making them insecure, it might be almost a type of separation almost issue. Uh, a lot of times when you have a man or a male figure in the environment, then that'll trigger that reaction in the dogs. And so fear-based barking is definitely something that, that we want to have a look at. And we'll give you some pointers here in a few minutes on how to address that. Yep. Uh, next one is separation anxiety, barking out of separation anxiety. And this is, you know, really when excessive barking is done when the dog's alone or when you leave uh, your dog alone. Um, and essentially, you know, this can also take the form of boredom. This could lead to other OCD type behaviors like pacing or destructiveness and obviously the, the endless amounts of barking. So this is really for, you know, dogs, I, I hear is most common for dogs that are starting to learn crate training. I've got a friend right now who's, uh, who's teaching his puppy crate training and uh, he's like, how do I get my dog to start barking at night? So that's a, that's a pretty common one too, is separation anxiety. And then the next one is excitement or sometimes called arousal where the dog is aroused by something that's exciting going on. It could be a car driving past on the outside. It could be a rollerblader. It could be somebody that's, that's just running in the, in the street or whatever. Um, you'll often get a situation where dogs become really kind of like patterned, almost like an OCD type pattern um, at the front window or the front door because they're so used to something going on on the outside and that triggers that type of, of barking. Um, you know, a lot of times when people talk about this, they say, well, I can live with that. The problem is that when the dog then starts escalating and then it steps up to another level where they start breaking things, jumping through windows, tearing down curtains or drapes, then obviously that's a big issue. Yeah. And yep. then the last one? And then the last one is alarm. Now this is kind of a, a tricky one because at some points you do want your dog to bark to basically alert you to something that you should be alerted to. Um, however, the best way to kind of address this and we'll talk more in detail in a second is really allowing your dog to bark in a, an alarm point of view, but then when you give the command to, to quiet up um, and to say, hey, I, I, I see what you're barking at, it's all good, you know, settle down now, that's really where the excessive barking needs to come down to, uh, to more control and so forth. And so we'll, we'll look at how to address each one of those here in a second. And so <clears throat> as we get into this addressing, I want to kind of point out something, and you will hear this a lot when you talk about these podcasts or when we talk about animal behavior, um, and this can actually be extended into other things too. In, in the next little while, we have a real cool surprise that Christopher's putting together of somebody who's going to come on our podcast with us. And I'm definitely going to bring this up because it's, it's something that actually applies in life. So the, the issue we're talking about is what I call foundation. Some people call that a, a kind of like a, a learning thing or a manners thing. But foundation is probably the best way. You know, what makes somebody a good a good student like for instance if i use christopher as the example here and i often have used him as example you know what made him when he went to college study work harder sure wasn't me sitting there micromanaging his days um you know he was getting up he was doing all his projects he got through his work he finished his, his degree early well what it was it was a combination of his foundation that he had learned through time and then his motivation to succeed well in dog training and in animal behavior we often look to the foundation if i get an email and i and i see emails all day long coming into school from people 95 percent of those people meaning nine out of ten emails 
are lack of foundation. Basically, the dog just doesn't get it. So when we look at barking, we look at the individual things, we're going to refer to foundation quite extensively. So what is foundation? Well, foundation is basically what makes your dog actually pay attention to you in general. Um, if you uh, look at children, for example, let's say you walk into somebody's home with your kids. Do they respect the home? Do they respect the people that they're visiting? You know, is this thing, well, I'm just going to hang out on the couch and watch TV. Um, you know, I don't want to pick on individual kids and so forth because I might get into trouble with family members here. But for example, let's say that I invite a family member over and he comes over with his kids. and The kids just jump on the couch and they're playing around with the remote without asking, well, is that a manners thing or how do we deal with that? And just for the record, I'm not talking about any of my family members here. So don't bother texting me or emailing me, uh, Andre and Warren. Uh, those are my brothers. Um, but basically, we're looking at, at, at manners. You know, same thing. If you interview somebody and you go in uh, and, and that person comes in for the interview and they show up clearly unprepared or they show up that they're really not all that interested, they're not really uh, familiar with what they're doing, again, that's patterning. They've, they've learned a pattern of not having had a good foundation as a child. You know, foundation might be taught to them by their parents, it might be a grandparent, and it could just as, all, as easily be friends. So with that in mind, you want to talk about dealing with some of the, the, the barking issues, but using foundation and using some of the other techniques? Yeah, and, and going into the foundation thing, I hear it you know, really well explained in the way that you can not also expect your dog to do something that you haven't taught before. So if you're mm -hmm. expecting your dog to quiet down because you say the word quiet, if they don't know the word quiet as a command to stop barking, then they're not going to listen to you because they don't know that they have to listen to you in that case. Right. And if, on that and then on that thing, the same thing with the word no. The people, yeah. you know, generally people use word no for everything under the sun. Or they use their word their dog's name as as the no and the come here right. as well. Right. So my dog's name's Connect. That means when Connect does something wrong, the first thing I do is yeah, Connect. Now sometimes it works. But it doesn't work because you're doing the right thing. It works because of the pressure and the energy you're putting on. Yeah. So go back to your name thing. So that's obviously a, a big issue, uh, yeah. the, using that same word or expression. Yeah. The, the command has to be linked to really what you want it to do. Uh, so going into kind of commands, let's look at uh, territorial barking that we mentioned earlier. So territorial barking is often motivated by a perceived threat. Now, I use the word perceived because it might be perceived to the dog, but it's not a real threat to you. For instance, if you know your family member is walking through the door, which often happens with our dogs, we have a, a bunch of little dogs, right? So we, we walk way through the many. door of... <laughs> He's, he says way too many, but then he always gets more, so he can't No, talk. no, no, no. That's not me. That's Sarah, just uh -huh. for the record. Well, who's and Alessandra, my daughter. Mm, sure. Um, but yeah, but I'm, what he's talking about is uh, Coco. Uh, we have this tiny little dog called Coco that a client had, and the client couldn't keep the dog. Actually, that, that's actually a really, good question, a really good point, because Coco is exactly one of these types of issues yeah. where, in Coco's case, there was a little bit of aggression involved, but it was this constant barking and picking and stuff like that. And despite the fact we put Coco through some training, the client just couldn't handle the training. And, and, and you know, sometimes people just, they try, but they just can't get it down. Anyways, back to Coco. So Coco had this constant thing, and she still does that occasionally, where she'll get territorial. So she'll use the barking as a territorial issue. And she'll basically, anytime somebody comes into Alessandra's room, even if it's me, she knows it's me, but she's got this bark that she does. We have to use the control, but it's like, settle down, quiet. And while I'm on that subject, you know, one of the things that always come up to us is when people say, well, I want my dog to bark. Well, we're not talking about that kind of barking. That's we're the talking, alarm. That's, that's the we'll alarm barking. Later. For a dog to bark is they sense there's something that's uncomfortable or, or they sense they just have like a sixth sense. Uh, I could talk for hours on that subject, by the way. Um, you know, dogs that are detection dogs, they'll sometimes, I, I've trained many, many, many protection dogs, I'm sorry, detection dogs, uh, specifically in like law enforcement and, and bomb detection. And there were many times where a dog could detect something, but which we would look at and say, how the heck did you even find that? Well, they have an ability to sense things. And, and it's kind of like, I don't know if it's electromagnetic or if it's just whatever, but we've seen it where dogs can sense things on the other side of a wall and so forth. Well, obviously, in the case of barking, they're sensing something. Now, we want them to bark. We want them to alert us and say there's somebody there. But then once we say, okay, that's enough, then we want the dog to stop. That's where training comes in. And that was Coco's problem. Coco just couldn't stop. So we inherited her and she basically hung out and yeah, I felt bad for her and I'm so, a sucker. What can I say? So funny enough, the one way to kind of stop or at least limit some territorial barking behaviors and it's funny because Amira actually just commented uh, her dog Sam is barking at people across the street and usually it's through the window so it's not even someone approaching the house um, and one way to actually limit that and it sounds really you know kind of silly because it's so simple is to just limit what they're able to see so mm -hmm. you know 
either having them in a crate where he can't see out the window and see the people barking, or if he's not in a crate, you know, have the window in a way or have his shades closed so that he can't get past that. Now, that might not be always applicable in some situations, and that's really where the, the training comes in. So when you're training the quiet command, um, and we'll talk more maybe in another episode on how to specifically train the quiet command, um, actually, funny enough, it's a it's a program in Hey Ludwig. So if you want to train the quiet command, go to Hey Ludwig, uh, and there's a, a video there and a tutorial on how to do that. But once you train the quiet command and you give that to your dog and they don't listen to you, that's really where your correction and your redirection comes into uh, redirecting back into obedience. So you correct the barking or you give the command. If they don't listen to you, then you correct and then you redirect back into your obedience and, and reward for the obedience behavior which then would be a, a, a consequence of, of not barking anymore and that sounds technical but once you actually start trying to do it it actually works really effectively um, something to consider as well that most times when dogs don't understand what you're yelling at them at I have an expression I call it psycho dad psycho mom so when I'm working with a client and they'll say something to the dog or they'll reprimand or punish the dog for something and I'll just say psycho dad and then they know that means they've done something if the dog has no idea what they're in effect punishing and barking fits into that category a lot of times if your dog is used to barking all day when you're not there and then you come home at night and your dog's barking and then you tell them to quiet your conditioning is not going to change what they've been practicing all day that's where you've got to really set up a pattern of of controlling it or as Christopher said limiting what they can do until you get that under control the next part of that that I want to emphasize is that when you do give an instruction whether it's quiet we use quiet in the kennels or settle is what I also like to use so it's kind of a calm but still firm tone settle quiet it's not shut up because that has a different meaning to us now the dog of course has no idea what any of these words mean but it's what's in your mind what's your perception of what you say or so we want like a like a soothing type tone yeah so it depends on your dog as well that's actually a good point by the way one of the things about Ludwig about this program is that we're trying to create develop and we have already but we're trying to get it to the point where you like Christopher just said so what if you have a dog that's much more gentle for example in my case I have two ex extremes in my home. I have a small little dog, belongs to Sarah, little dog called Mika, it's a rescue that she adopted. This dog is basically scared of its own shadow. I seriously think if the dog runs outside and sees its shadow on the ground of the sun, it's gonna turn and race back inside the house, peeing all the way. That's how scared this little dog is, and that's never gonna change. It's a printed, yeah, I wouldn't say printed, it's a behavior that's established in the dog's mind, genetics mostly, and then just basically never learn. Then I go to the other extreme where I have my big dogs and with them I've got to raise more tone and I've got to put more energy onto the correction. So there you have two completely different personalities in dogs. So the way I'm gonna say settle to Mika is gonna be settle, very soft, very gentle tone, and to the bigger dog is gonna be, hey, settle, calm, stay calm, because they're very high drive and almost anxious, but but the, Belgian, the, the one dog I'm referring to, Belgian Malinois, very, very intense dog. So with him, I've spent my life calming him. His barking is more about just trying to get attention. Yep. And when you have a high drive dog like that, then you're basically trying to bring that attention back under control again. Um, fearful barking. Fearful barking. So when you have fearful barking, that's where a dog is kind of reacting to something that's triggering that bark. So let's just use the example I used earlier on of, of the male figure and that male figure could be somebody wearing a hat you know when you when you put a hat on a hat I, and, and I don't know if I can glasses. put the hat on with the logo I'll put it the other way around so it's not too bad but sometimes you put a hat on then dogs see that as being more of a, a larger presence it's kind of like a, a dominant presence and there's a lot of debate in the animal world as to whether or not that's legit but I genuinely believe if you look at animals that puff themselves out birds that puff themselves out dogs that raise their hackles that's the hair on the back of the back they're doing that because they're getting they're trying to make themselves look bigger if you look at two people that get into an argument they kind of stand up um, there was a story last night about uh, Charlie Sheen was it Charlie Sheen I can't remember well, anyway some big oh, famous sure. movie person and the person was interviewing him and he asked a really difficult question and and as soon as he asked that question then the actor kind of did this well that's that same thing he's basically feeling that emotion and so he's trying to make himself look bigger why this is important is that if you have a dog that is insecure and that is likely to maybe bite or nip, that's a warning. And if you push that dog too hard, you're gonna get bitten. So if you get bitten, then you can't come back and say, well, gee, I got bitten because I put too much pressure on the dog. Yeah. So when that dog barks, that dog's barking out of more of a, of a fear. And so that's, that's a second or a third warning to you, that statue of the dog being timid, whatever, or a dog that is kind of putting on a, on a show, 
um, and clearly doesn't have a lot of confidence. A lot of these things can be brought, brought back to just straight confidence. Well, and, and socialization too. If socialization. Yeah. A lot of times, you know, it's, it's funny because a lot of people literally come to us and they say, my dog's racist. And, and what they're implying is that their dog barks at or, or growls at certain races of people and doesn't growl at other races. And it, it's really simple. It's because their dog's around that certain race more often than not. And so when they have something that come, uh, a person that comes into the picture that is not what they're used to, then they are more fearful or more aware or more weary of that person. Um, and so it's, it's really easy to train. It's just more socialization and, and we can, we'll talk more socialization in another episode where we can dive deeper into it. Um, but I think Wilbur had a, a question. Yeah. Which probably and and Wilbur, I'm going to come to a question right now, but Christopher raised a really good point, this whole socialization thing. And it reminded me of an email I saw today and I'm not sure if this person's watching. So I hope I don't hurt your feelings when I say this, but as you get to know who we are and who I am, my job is to give you solutions and help you out. Um, and the email was about, he has a young dog, I think it's a puppy, and he wants to bring it to puppy class, but the puppy is reactive towards other uh, dogs and barks intently and tries to bite, or actually I think it's not towards dogs, it's towards people, I'm sorry, it's towards people, it tries to nip and bite and so forth, but it's a puppy. Well, he wants to bring his dog into socialization, to do socialization, I should say, into a puppy class. The problem with puppy classes is that you also have a bunch of other puppies out there that don't want to be intimidated. So that's actually a tricky situation, and we're going to have to give them a call tomorrow and, and kind of figure out a way for us to do this, because what you don't want to do is to bring a dog that is being demonstrative, being pushy, being attitude towards other dogs or people into a class where there's a bunch of tiny people. Just imagine if you were trying to train a teenager or a or a person that was having some behavioral issues in the same setting where you've got a bunch of five and six and seven year old children, it's not a good environment for them to be in. So when we do that and the socialization, especially related to barking, just keep that in mind. If you're not sure about this stuff and if it gets too technical, then give us a shot and let us know. I really so let me go to Wilbur's question. Yeah, the one you and, want me? yeah and to, to point out something, uh, Wilbur, and you probably might ad address this here in a second. So. If you're already correcting your dog for a behavior, it might be barking at the neighbor, it might be doing something, you have to consider how much your correction is really meaning to the dog. Right. So if I tell someone, or if I tell my dog, no, 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 and he's not listening, or if he listens only on the third no, or if he only listens on whatever, then you're just teaching your dog to only have to listen to you on that third no, or on the fourth no, or when you actually get up and go over, you're not really escalating properly and that's really what uh, what it comes down to is the is the concept of escalation which is another thing actually we discuss in Ludwig, in Ludwig we yeah, here. escalation um, uh, and it's actually a term that's not commonly used in the dog training world it's something that we started using and there's lots of you know every trainer out there has a click and has a term it drives me I shouldn't say it drives me crazy but you know just remember that we all have our own little things and and especially if you have somebody like myself that's self-taught. That's a dangerous thing. Self-taught means that I've had literally dozens of years of experience with tens of thousands of dogs, but I don't always know the technical side of it. I can explain to you what to do. Um, and probably a better example, uh, many years ago, I had a trainer working for me. Uh, actually came to work for me and eventually became my head trainer. And she's now a very highly qualified trainer. Doesn't work for, well, she does work for, no, she doesn't work for us anymore. She kind of helps out every now and again. Uh, her name's Monica. Uh, so if she's listening, you know, I'm talking about you. But anyway, she was a perfect example. When she started training with us, she was awesome at reading dogs' behavior, learning how to understand them, learning how to address the things like we're talking about. But she had a real difficult time explaining to clients what it was. And we actually used, we almost came to blows a few times with her and I because I kept saying, go on, you've got to learn how to work with people too. And she's like, nope, I just want to work with dogs. So it's a, it's a big deal. So let's go to the, uh, the question that you raised. I'm just going to scroll back up here. Because we're trying to go back and forth. I can't see her question. Wilbur? Yeah. Right here. I got it. Um, so Wilbur says, um, Wilbur Jones writes, uh, My dogs bark at the neighbor every time he comes out of the house. No matter how many times I correct them, they keep barking. Any thoughts? So this is actually a really good question because you're not the only person struggling with this. This probably applies to 80% of people out there. I always say in class, so who of you are having a problem with this? Everyone put your hand up because literally everybody has that problem. So this is good advice for everybody. If your dog is non-responsive to the correction or to the punishment, when I say punishment, I don't mean beating up on the dog. Punishment is a term we use for something that is, that is uncomfortable for a dog. It could be withholding something, but it could be a check on the training collar or a leash. Uh, it could be a no. Anything like that is a punisher, right? So anytime that you punish the dog and the dog is non-responsive, layman's terms, dog basically says, the heck with you, stuff you, I'm not going to listen. 
What you've got to do then is you've got to try and reduce the amount of, of surrounding. What? Nothing. Oh, you can't do that. That's not allowed. I saw that out of the corner of my eye. Anyway, you've got to reduce it down so that you can control it a little bit more effectively. And the, the explanation I often use is think of training. So we start off with training as a foundation, right? The baseline. There's my baseline at the bottom. One of these days we need a whiteboard so I can draw this yeah. stuff onto a whiteboard. Okay, so on my foundation, so let's say the dog does something inappropriate, right? So now he steps up to step one. So now he's testing you a little bit. Not a lot, but just a little. If you don't do anything about that, that step one becomes step two. And then it becomes step three, step four, step five. If you control it at step one and two and bring it back down to the baseline, now you're back in balance again. Now you have a lot more success. If your dog, however, is all the way up there at step five, neighbor, street, got away with it, learned a bunch of times, learned to be successful a bunch of times, meaning they were successfully able to bark at the neighbor with minimal or any consequence. Even if you think you're punishing the dog, dog didn't care. Well, now they're up there at step seven, eight, nine. When your dog is in a high drive mode, it's extremely difficult to bring them from there back down to baseline again. So what you gotta do is you gotta stage exercises, right? Staging is a, is a phenomenal part, we all stage. Every, every athlete out there stages training. When we shoot competitively, we practice the same way that we shoot. We don't go out to practice and just sort of throw a few things around. We literally go there and say, okay, now we're in a work mode and we start our practice the same way. We're staging the exercise without all the other distractions and without the complexities of being in competition, in your dog's case, without the street and the neighbor and all that stuff. I want to see how my control's doing. I'm giving a lot of explanation to this because it's a big problem and I know when I explain it, I hear people still go back and then doesn't, they don't succeed and they look at me and they're like, well, I don't understand. I'm like, well, you're back up at step four already and you're, you're trying to bring the dog from step four all the way down. So again, I'm working on the basics. I'm doing my heel work, sit down, stay, just some control training, getting my dog to pay attention to me. And once I've got that, then I'm going to go outside to where the neighbor would otherwise be. I'm going to practice in that same area. By doing that, I'm creating a new baseline, a baseline where I'm in control. Then I'm going to bring the neighbor out or maybe just have a friend kind of walk around in the street or something, but a low level um, um, uh, distraction, not a high level distraction like your neighbor. And the other thing to remember is that if you use the neighbor, your dog is already patterned to doing this over and over and over and over. So you then trying to break a pattern that has been well established, kind of like somebody who's got an addiction towards smoking or anything like that. It's very difficult to bring that back down from, you know, well, just stop smoking. Well, it's not that easy, right? So again, to finalize this thing, what I want to see you do is to keep, is to work on the lower step, step one, step two. Once your dog comes back down to ground level, to baseline, then you do, go to, then you test the next step. And eventually you get to the point, like bring the neighbor out. Maybe have the neighbor, If you, I'm not sure if you want the dog to be friends. I don't think you said this. I think he just wants to stop barking. Just stop barking. You might have to work a little bit on building a relationship between the neighbor and your dog, but you know, you may not choose to do that. If you choose to do that, you have them come out and do some training with you. Literally sit there and pay the dog with a, uh, some rewards, some food or anything like that, treats, whatever. Uh, so the dog learns to work with that guy and not see him as a potential threat. A lot of times when it's territorial like that, it, it might appear that it's the neighbor, but it might also just be that it's just somebody, in which case you're gonna train the same way. You're gonna work in the street. We do street training all the time. We have dog classes that go out, go out in public. We train those dogs the same way. There's lots of distraction, there's cars, there's noise, there's smells, all of those things. We gradually introduce those distractions, but we make sure we have a solid foundation before we do that. We got another question from uh, uh, real, real quick because we were already almost 30 minutes in so we got to try and get through some of the, the rest of the points and then we can get back to uh, Donna's okay. question here. So uh, the, the next kind of stage is separation anxiety. So dogs that are barking when they're left alone, usually when it's left alone in the crate or even just left alone uh, at home and what these usually turn into is is OCD type behavior. So the dog just bark, bark, barks all day long because it's just something to do yeah. and it's something to kind of cure that boredom. So there's a few things, you know, each solution might work better and, and differently for different people. Uh, the first is actually giving your dog a chew toy, an appropriate chew toy, something that they can't destroy and that they can't ingest. Uh, but a chew toy that either has like maybe your scent on it uh, and actually limiting it to that chew toy only. So that way that they know when they get that chew toy that they can associate that with, you know, maybe being left alone, but that it's in a state of not separation anxiety that you might necessarily be leaving, but that they're just going to be left alone. And that kind of brings to the, the next part of it, which is you can leave your dog alone, especially when you're doing crate training without necessarily leaving your dog. So if you make the crate, which is typically seen as a, 
you know, nerve wracking space where they're they're left alone. You're leaving the house. Um, for those dogs, it's nerve wracking. Yeah, for yeah. those dogs. Yeah. If 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 it's uh, if they're trained properly, then they love the crate. Like our dogs will go and, and lie in the crate before or without us even telling them because it's their space. It's their you know den. The dogs are are denning animals. Uh, so if you cr train the crate properly, uh, then then it's it's a really great tool. Uh, so for dogs that aren't barking though, uh, because of the separation anxiety, you can leave them in the crate and not necessarily leave the area so that they don't associate the crate with you leaving. That's a, another way. Uh, I also have heard of people using like wireless speakers or speakers that are connected to their phone so that if their dog starts barking, they can talk to the dog and let them know that they're still there. Again, this is separation anxiety alone, not any type of other behavior like territorial where the dog's actually barking at something. This is just, you know, OCD type behavior where the dog's just barking because they're alone and, and bored. Uh, and the other thing that is really critical is actually not rewarding your dog with their attention when they are barking because they're being left alone. So a lot of times, again, going back because this is most commonly seen with puppies as they're starting to learn crate training, uh, a lot of people when they're when their pups whining in the crate or barking in the crate, they go back and they give their attention to their dog because that stops the barking. But what you're actually doing is rewarding your dog with what they want. They want your attention. And so you're going, you're giving them attention when they're barking. So the next time you leave, they figure, oh, well, every single time I bark, mom's going to come back and visit me. So I'm going to keep barking. I'm going to keep doing that because I know that it's going to get the reward of their attention. Uh, and obviously you're not intending that to be the case, but that's a, and effectively what you're training. Uh, so the, the way to do that is you let your dog bark and you basically just leave them. It's like leaving a, a baby when they're crying. And then the second that they quiet, quiet down and they stop barking, that's when you go over and you reward. And with enough consistency and repetition and, and good timing, uh, then eventually they will uh, learn that they only get the attention and they only get what they want when you don't reward them with, uh, or when, they, when they're not barking. And you know, Christopher raises a really good point with that, that thing of reward. And, and I see Bobby uh, wrote a question, wrote a, made a comment here, which kind of ties to that as well. My dogs get excited when I leave because they get a special treat that they only get when I leave, meaning he leaves. So yeah. that's worked for him. And that goes back to that um, toy. Uh, right. That they, yeah. and, and you know, that's what this, also, what this really means is that if your dog learns to associate something that's good, meaning a treat, with behaving appropriately, that's a really good combination. That's a really good association that you've got. Uh, sometimes what happens is that, like Christopher said, if a dog barks and you then go pay them attention, then they think, oh, if I need to get attention, then I just got to bark or whine or cry or scratch at the crate or any of those type of things. And then it becomes a little trickier. And so I want to just mention, uh, just talk about that briefly as well. When you have a situation like that, and this is more the extreme cases, so one of the things that we've done in Ludwig is try to separate out the real basic things. So if you, if you say, well, my dog is jumping up and down. Well, okay, how do I stop that? Well, I do this and this and this and this. But then you get another dog that when he jumps up and down, he's actually doing it in an extremely demonstrative way and maybe even nipping at the same time hurting. Well, the way we train that dog is going to be different from the dog that's jumping up and down in the first example. And we've tried with Ludwig to create a distinction between that. So this is actually a good example uh, here when we have a dog that is barking and you want to kind of stop, but if you don't want to pay attention, then you get into that thing of like, okay, what do I do? You gotta do it step by step. The first thing you wanna do is try and get the dog to calm down in the crate, maybe close the door and then open the door. Close the door, open the door. Try and not let the dog bark. If the dog is holding and he's nice and quiet, then you can leave your door closure time, you can make that a little longer. And again, you've gotta test this. That's why there's no easy fix for a lot of these more extreme cases. You've gotta like, you gotta do something, evaluate the response. Do something, evaluate the response. It's no different from us shooting. You know, we, we work on our, our speed or work on our accuracy or whatever. We say, okay, we're falling off the log a little bit. We've got to back that off. We've got to work a little more, put a little more time into that and, and kind of push that envelope all the time. You know, athletes deal with it. Work is the same thing. You know, you've got to work. Balance. You've got to, absolutely, you've got to, got to about balance. I want to go to uh, Donna's question here because she raises a, a really good point which fits into this extreme category we're talking about right now. So, <clears throat> Uh, she writes here, our dog, to have a cattle dog. Take note, I'll come back to that. Our cattle dog goes crazy jumping on the coffee table and barking. If you turn on or off the ceiling fan, he can't take his eyes off the fan. Even when we pick up the remote, he goes crazy. Or when we open the drawer that it's in. I'm going to come back to that. I try putting treats in here, but he still thinks of the fans, not the treats. I would love to calm him down more, but nothing seems to work. This weekend, it was the windshield wipers. So really simple here. First thing is, 
anytime you get a high drive dog, you're going to have to pay the price with some of these things. So Belgian Malinois, the famous you know dogs we all think law enforcement has right now, not a good pet because they're very high drive. Cattle dogs, very high drive dogs. They were bred and raised to chase cattle. And if you've ever watched cattle herding, the cows don't play nice with those dogs. Those dogs learn that you know they're going to step lively or they get kicked 15, 20 feet across the arena. I've seen lots of cattle dogs in my younger days when we were training, lots of dogs, I should say, uh, literally get kicked unconscious by the cows. So cattle dogs are very intense, very high drive dogs. We have to take that into account when we deal with them. And I'm no doubt that Dawna knows all about that. Uh, nobody has a cattle dog that doesn't. Jack Russell's are the same. So in her particular case, she has a dog that is fixated, almost like an OCD again, fixated on the ceiling fan. It's a moving item. It could just as easily have been a bicycle or a rollerblader or you know a cat that lives next door or something like that there's all sorts of these kinds of variations uh, i grew up in a rural environment and the biggest thing we used to deal with there was dogs chasing and, kill and killing chickens don't see a whole lot of that anymore because we're in a different environment right now but in the dawn in your case there's not a lot you can do to stop a dog with high drive from being fixated on the object what you've got to do is channel and you actually are doing it as you pointed out by using the treats the problem is that a treat for a, for a dog with high drive, a treat is a far lower value than the drive itself. <laughs> There's not much you can do about that short of getting another dog, which obviously you're not going to do. But it's a, you've got to constantly balance this thing. I have Malinois and Dutch Shepherds, and I've got to constantly find ways to keep them amused. Otherwise, they become a problem. They start you know, doing things they shouldn't do. They might be nipping at themselves or licking at themselves, OCD type things. Um, etc. And of course, they're two dominant males. And so I got to watch the two of them together. But you can always see these signs. Um, so what you're doing is quite right. You're using treats, but I would actually bring in the treats a little sooner before the dog gets into a very high drive state of mind. Um, you mentioned that when you get the remote, and I think you meant that by that the remote that controls the fan. So your dog has, has bridged, it's called bridging, when they tie two or three or more things together, the dog has bridged together the fan and the remote. No different from dogs that go on walks with their owners and the guy picks up his keys and the moment he picks up his keys, the dogs are running for the front door because they know that sound equals I'm going to get a walk in the next five minutes or when you get a leash out of the kitchen table. So you, if, you, if that becomes a problem, you've got to desensitize those things. Reach for the remote over and over and over. Like, you know, reach for it, put it down. Reach for it, put it down. Reach for it, put it down. Desensitize that so the dog doesn't see that as being that connection. Um, another thing, because you, you're not going to stop the dog chasing the fan. That, right now, that's what that dog lives for. And, and to that dog, that's way more important than what you could ever stop. You can't even beat up on your dog enough to actually stop things like that, especially in the very high drive dogs. So that, that's what you want to hear, but... That's that's the answer. Uh, we got excitement. time for one more. Well, so so we've got a couple more points that we uh, that we want to talk about excitement. You kind of talked about it here. Um, what I actually really wanted to address was the concept of like dogs when they're playing. So we see this all the time in our daycare area where dogs will be playing with each other and they're barking and out of play, which again is not necessarily a poor behavior, but you just have to kind of watch their arousal levels and watch their energy levels and make sure that it's not escalating out of control because it can escalate from barking to all of a sudden nipping to even more aggressive and reactive behaviors, which is obviously something that we don't want. So a little bit of barking out of play is not necessarily a bad thing. It's normal. It's perfectly normal for dogs it's how they communicate to each other um, as long as it's not in excess and as long as it's not uh, increasing out of out of control uh, and then the alarm so again this is if a dog's barking out of an alarm uh, basically alerting you to something which again is not necessarily a bad thing because you do want them to alert you to that but you want to have that command that quiet command and what I've actually heard is that uh, and, and what we've done is if you actually teach your dog to speak or to bark on command by using a speak command which again is, is taught in Ludwig is one of the tricks that you can teach your dog there if you teach your dog to speak on command then you can teach them to quiet on command a lot easier uh, so that's something to consider if your dog is barking in excess and uh, it's out of even territorialness or any other thing is to actually teach your dog to speak so that you have that uh, that second part which is teaching them to quiet as well uh, hey, I want to ask something real fast. So yeah. I'm having a hard time. I see we've, we've up, run around 18 to 20 uh, viewers tonight, which is really awesome. I really appreciate that, guys. Yeah, and, seriously. you know, keep it up. That's uh, that's more than what we normally get. And it's, uh, it's pretty cool. And 
as Christopher has said before, if we if we get more interest in this and you guys are enjoying this and getting a lot out of it, then you know I'd be happy to do it on a on a more regular basis, like on a weekly basis. But I do want to ask you one thing. Um, it's difficult for us to see who all is online or who came online. So do me a favor, just in the comments section of the page, just post your name. You don't have to say anything. Just post your name in there, and then that way we can go back and we can see who our our loyal visitors are and fans are and and followers are, and we can hopefully find a way to reward you guys later on maybe with a treat yeah exactly uh so talking a little bit about bark collars uh do you want to talk a little yeah. bit about so <laughs> if you guys are not following the news the whole dog training world is is moving in a direction that i don't think is a really good direction we've we we're starting to see cases down in florida was the first one california's followed and i just heard yesterday about pennsylvania um, where they're trying to ban and they're bringing in legislation trying to ban things like training collars, prong collars, e-collars, electronic training collars, uh, those types of things. Or saying that if a trainer uses an e-collar, that's a cruel form of punishment and that we can basically be prosecuted for that. There's a case that's going on right now in, uh, in Nevada. And, and I don't know the people involved, but and, and it may be potentially that they were actually doing something that was inappropriate um, because I haven't seen all the detail, but that was also involving an e-collar. So let me explain this e-collar thing to you. First of all, the e-collar, for those of you who don't know, it's an electronic collar. I don't have one right now in front of me here. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, you have a remote control and you have a collar receiver that is on the dog, right? And when, the do when you uh, set the receiver up this way and you, and you want to correct the dog or punish the dog for something, you give a little nick on the remote and that triggers a nick to the receiver on the dog. It doesn't hurt the dog. Ironically, out of all the training aids out there, including halties and harnesses and, and all the things, I shouldn't mention names, I suppose, but... You know, the point is that you guys want to know these names and you should know these names. But all the training aids out there, the e-collar, if used correctly, is probably the least likely to actually injure a dog because you're using a tiny stim on the dog. You're not supposed to be knocking the dog off its feet. Yeah. That's and actually it's not emotional. Right. That is, yeah, exactly. So, so what Christopher means by that is that if you go to your dog and you're mad at your dog and you go like, no, that's a bad dog and you grab him by the scruff of the neck and whatever, that's emotional. A lot of dogs look at you and like, whoa, psycho dad, psycho mom. Like, I don't understand what the hell you're yelling at, but I just know you're yelling. Just think of an argument you had with somebody, <laughs> can I say, ex-girlfriend or something like that, that, that kind of escalated and, and eventually you don't even know what the heck you're fighting over, right? So the problem with, with any kind of punitive training is that the dog has to understand what you're punishing. So for example, we have a little game that we play and, and this is one of the shortfalls of videos. I can't do this with you. But let's say that I took something like this and I offered this to Christopher. And as he reached his hand out, I had an electronic collar that was attached to you know him or whatever. And as he touched that, I gave him a nick. He would associate that nick with touching this key. That is how you teach association with an e-collar, right? Now, there's other techniques as well. Uh, there's, the, there's the Fred Hassan system where they use a, a slightly different thing, uh, approach to it. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this where you use it as a punisher, right? So now what's this got to do with barking? You get two types of bark collars or electronic collars used in barking. You get one that is an electronic collar I just described to you triggered by remote control and then you get another which is self-activating so it's, it's normally called a bark collar uh, or bark inhibitor is the new politically correct word, term and they put the dog you put the bark collar on the dog you generally set the level that you wanted to go to uh, bark collars sometimes will spray citronella they have all sorts of things that can be activated uh, they can be citronella they can be tone can be a vibration or it can be a nick right um all of those things are self-activated by the moment the dog starts to bark, the, the vibration in the dog's throat trigger the collar. Depending on the collar, it'll normally nick the dog like one time. It might come back again a few seconds later, sometimes seven to 10 seconds later, depending on the manufacturer. And so if the dog keeps barking, it'll nick them again, and then it'll wait for a while. So you don't have a constant punisher all the time through. Um, I'm not gonna get into too much more detail than that here tonight because we're running out of time. But, yep. but a bark collar is a very effective tool if used correctly. So what we don't want to have happen is for you to put the bark on the dog and go to work. You've got to put it on while you're home. You can kind of monitor how much energy the dog can handle. And remember what I said, you're not supposed to be nicking the dog to the point of pain. It's basically just an inhibitor. It's basically saying to him, don't do that, right? On the subject of that, remember that sometimes if a dog yelps, 
It's not necessarily a pain yelp, it's often just an expression. Again, that's something we must maybe discuss at another evening, but that's also going around right now because one of the claims made in this loss, in this, uh, in this bill, is that if a dog yelps, that that means that it's cruel. Well, I'm not sure about that. You know, if you give somebody a fright because they, you startle them and they yelp or they yell out, they're not being hurt by that, but certainly it would be a negative association. If you walk around a corner and I grab you, uh, you're going to yell, but you're not going to be hurt by that. But you're going to remember the next time, be careful walking well, you around a corner. Just jumped out and said, boo. Right. So, so remember, when we start talking about behavioral training, we're talking about all these types of triggers and so forth. So bark collars work really well yes. if they're used correctly. And two, if you're not sure about how to use them and get somebody to help you out with that. Electronic collars that are remote controlled, we often use them to train the dog the first time, first few times I should say, to establish the pattern in the dog, and then we we'll switch over to a bark collar after that. Yep, so that's really the it. That's our, our deep dive into yeah, 45 fucking, minutes into this. Yeah, it, this was supposed we, to be a 15, 20 minute program, yeah, by the way. Well, I thought we'd go to 30, but anyway, we appreciate having you guys. I see we still got a constant thing. Yeah. Um, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to write them online. We'll, uh, Christopher and I will both kind of keep watching this. We've set it up now in the future that we can actually go back and forth like this. So when he's talking, I can monitor the questions and respond to things. But we really appreciate you guys sitting in with us. Yeah. So now, um, you know, we've taken a look at the, the causes of barking, how to address them. But the, the biggest thing is that this is not necessarily a solution for everyone. Uh, if you're not winning with these methods and, uh, and you need more help, reach out to us. This is what we do, um, both as a, a professional level at Partners. Uh, again, there's a, a link to the website here in the description, as well as we're doing more online. If you don't want to actually come and see us, if, if we scare you, uh, then you can you know work with Hey Ludwig, and, and that's really what this is all about, uh, is just educating you guys, giving you guys a, a better education, your dog a better education, hopefully a, a happier relationship together in that. So with that being said, we have our question of the day, and this is a three-parter. Uh, this is a new thing that we're gonna do. So, uh, you know, we kind of asked this a little bit inside there. Has your dog ever actually barked excessively? What kind of barking was it, and how did you address it? So those are the three questions. It's also in the description if you can't remember, uh, but those are the, the three questions we want you guys to answer in the in the comments section below. And so it's like a test? No, it's not a test. It's just uh, really getting feedback on, getting, on their side. And that way, okay. you know, if they if they write in at the end of the week and, and we have time, we'll go back and we'll try and, and give you guys some direction based, uh, based on your answers. Uh, for next week, unfortunately, you won't be here, so... I yeah, I'm going to be to in Florida next episode. week, and we, we, Christopher had an awesome plan to invite some close friends of ours that you guys would love to see. I think see. we're still going to do it. You're still going to do it without me? It Are you kidding? To. You're breaking my heart. I know, but they're, and I think they're very busy I schedules. think I'm traveling as well. Uh, I mean, I'm on a plane. But anyway, we'll see if we can figure out, because Aaron did ask here, when's the next show? So right now, next show is scheduled for next Wednesday, uh, so, 6 p.m. So next Wednesday at 6 p.m. and Mountain I did Standard put it, Time. Yeah, Mountain Standard Time, so that's one hour before... One hour before, one hour after Pacific Standard. Well, it depends on time of year. Yeah, I guess, right? All right. Okay, so one hour, or sorry, it's 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time on Wednesdays is what I'm trying to shoot for. Yep. Um, now, the guests next week that we're talking about, because I did put it in the description, is... Are you going to tell them who it is? Yeah, I already put it in the description, uh, so they can go see right now. So it's Bethany Maddox-Sands and her husband, Justin. They're going to be joining us on the show. Bethany is a multi-champion you know tennis player justin's competed or, or sorry not competed but uh but played in the nfl he's her coach they've traveled the world in in doing sports and a bunch of competitions so this is kind of that aspect of competition personal development mindset and and business that we're really wanting to get into her uh instagram is at Maddox Sands, Maddox I believe. Sands. Yeah. Yep. At Maddox Sands on Instagram. She's got a hundred thousand, hundred twenty thousand followers. So we're gonna have them on the show next week. I'm super excited about that. Uh, if you guys have any questions, again, leave them in the comments below and I'll, I'll try to ask them and, and hopefully you'll be around for it. Maybe we won't do it on Wednesday. We'll try to find a time where you're here. So. We're gonna, we, we'll have a look at that and see because we didn't realize that until today. But, yeah. um, you know, Bethany, for those of you who don't know, is obviously, you know, phenomenal tennis player, was number one in doubles. Uh, she's a gold medalist uh, at the Olympics. But most important, she's also a very close friend of ours and we've trained their dogs for years, their dog Ruger for years. Maybe we'll put Ruger in the shot somehow. Yeah. Big, just little, said Ruger 140 pound dog. But, but the part that's really important and what, that I'm really excited about is that Bethany has spent her life learning to deal with the emotional and the mental aspect of competition. And so much, I mean, I can't tell you the number of conversations that I've had with her you know, middle of the night, literally three in the morning and she's playing in 
wherever, Europe or Australia, whatever the case is, and we're texting back and forth about you know, how to approach things mentally because the mental side of life is very difficult to deal with. We compete in shooting, in shooting sports, and you know, if you make a mistake, it's very hard to recover from that mistake. And, and you know, a lot of times when people have a, a difficult part of their lives or they go through a difficulty, you know, being able to learn to deal with your emotions is a critical part of that. And Bethany's got some pretty phenomenal things and techniques and stuff that she's learned from really, you know, but herself, but also from really famous people, amongst others, uh, Lanny Basham. So those of you in the shooting world, you all know Lanny Basham. He's one of the, the greatest mental trainers uh, out there. Um, so I'm super excited. I'm going to figure out a way that I can be on this thing next next week, or we're going to be doing it another day. <laughs> but we'll have to see because Beth and them are only here for a short amount of time. But yeah. anyway, it's super exciting, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to that as well. So um, I think we're good. Yeah. Um, thanks everybody for the comments and for dialing in. Uh, you got anything else? That's it. We'll see you guys. Uh, we'll see you next week.